Hi, I'm Brenda Wood, and I'm here again with another edition of Things by Bren. And today we are with Zoe Ann Brown, and her story is absolutely fascinating. It is completely different than any of the other ones we have shown on the show. She actually received clemency from President Barack Obama. And was it Barack Obama or was it Trump? No, it was Obama. That's what I thought. Okay, just want to make sure because because yeah. your time that you got out. Um, when yep. she's going to tell us a little bit about herself and uh, her situation, and then I'll I'll ask you some questions as we go. So everybody, meet Zoanne, and tell us a little bit about you. Hi, I'm Zoanne, and <laughs> let's see. Well. All I can really tell you is let's start from the beginning, I guess. My the best place to story start. is a case. Yeah. My story is a case of addiction. As cliche as it may sound, it is a case of addiction. By the time I was 13, I had already mastered the, the pattern of pushing down my feelings. And um, I started experimenting with marijuana. Uh, one thing led to another, you know, I mean, just roughly going through my life, I think all the wrong choices and wrong things I've made, I would never say anywhere in my life that I said, oh, I want to be a drug dealer or anything like that. I never grew up thinking that that was going to happen, but I do know that addiction took over and one thing led to another. And then there were several deaths that happened that, that mm. led to it also, so and then eventually incarceration. Yes. Were you expecting to get indicted? No, no. So when you finally not... got charged, what went through your mind? What was happening? Um, I can still remember the day, just like it was yesterday, the day I got in trouble or whatever they came to my house, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, nobody's gonna be, nobody's gonna, be here when my kids get off the bus today you know yeah so. how, how old were they um i have four kids and they were 14 um 11 10 and 7 so a variety of ages which are yeah. young to a teenager which still has a very huge impact on them yeah yeah it did and the whole thing. did you get bail or bond or or any type of uh pretrial release no, I was denied all that. They said I was a flight risk. So you sat in a holding facility until your case was pled out and went to prison. How long were you I, in a holding facility? 18 months. I was in like three different holding facilities, actually. So Holding facilities are tough. Yeah. They yeah. Are tough. 18 months. And like we discussed earlier, that was it. Sad as it may seem, it was a relief to get to prison so I could at least get some fresh air and get outside. But. Yes, yes, that is true. <clears throat> it's said that to be in jail is worse than being in prison because there is no freedom. Yeah, that's that's sad, ain't it? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> so, so, how much time uh, did you actually get? I got 292 months for possession with intent to deliver methamphetamine. Oh my goodness. Now, did you sign a plea for that or did you have an open plea? No, I didn't sign up. I, well, I think I signed a plea at first. Now that I think about it, I did sign a plea. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But you had no Which intention of getting on my part. I had a horrible lawyer and yeah, it was a dumb situation. I was ignorant to the whole situation. I'd never been in a situation like that and really didn't know the legality of all of it and how to you know, what to do, what to say, what not to say, all that, so. Did you have a public defender? I did, yes. and she was not very good. She didn't stick up for me for any of the things. What She told me I was only gonna get 15 years at the most, and I even thought, wow, okay, that's a, you know, a huge amount. You know, that's why I say, I knew I was doing wrong. I need, needed to be punished. I'm not saying I didn't, but right. 24 years and four months was extreme. And when she said I was going to get 15 years, I was not thrilled with that either. But she guaranteed me, she pretty much guaranteed me before I went in that I was going to have 15 years. Now, did you get a pre-sentencing investigation? Yep. What did it say in it? On What did they suggest for your time? I don't remember what it said, to be honest. I really don't remember. It was a long time it. ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 So 
Yeah, it's been over 15 years ago. I don't really remember. I would have to find that and see what it said. I don't remember it saying what it suggested. Sometimes they do. It might not. I, I don't know. Every state does things a little different. What state were you uh, indicted in? Iowa. Iowa. Mm -hmm. And yeah. did you, you went from a holding facility to your first prison. Which one was that? Um, <laughs> that was FMC. The, the realest prison I was in. To be, not, maybe not realist is the right word, but I would say the most hardcore prison. And you, it had cut out. Could you say again which prison? Uh, FMC Carswell. Carswell. That's the medical facility, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had no medical issues. I had nothing wrong with me whatsoever. I don't, I didn't go there and get an evaluation or anything like that. That's just where I was sent, which was from Iowa clear across to, you know, Texas was a long ways away yeah, from any is. family. And where, how long did you stay there? I stayed there for two and a half years till Wasika switched over to um, from male to female and they were asking for volunteers to go there. I remember seeing the sign up in Carswell and I, I went in, told my case manager and volunteered to go. So Did and I you... stayed in Wasika for like eight and a half years. Okay. Okay. Now, is that where you were, where you were released from? Nope. Nope. I kept begging and begging for years to be able to go to a camp because I knew you could go to camp. Everyone kept saying you had to have 10 years or under to go to camp, but I realized that I looked up the law. You didn't have to have 10 years or under. That was not one of the things. So I kept begging my counselors and my caseworker, case managers to go to a camp. But eventually a year before I got my clemency, they decided I could go to a camp and I went to Phoenix okay. and that's where I got my that's, that's where I received my clemency. And you're still in Arizona? Yeah. Well, I just moved here like five, four months ago. Okay. Well, so. this is where her story gets interesting because we've done interviews with lots of people who have done time. We've talked to family members. We've spoken to some politicians, uh, leaders of organizations, but she received clemency. And that's huge because there was a small percent of people who do that. Can you explain what clemency is and the process it took to go through to get that? So there was a big hype in the prison. I remember everybody was talking about, oh, there's a clemency thing. You have to just fill out this thing on the computer and you go on the computer and you fill it out and you answer these questions. Have you, do you have a nonviolent crime? Have, do you have any infractions during your prison time? Have you um, served at least 10 years? And so anyways, I went online, I filled it out and come to find out that Obama had made this project, this clemency project, and he had made this clemency project so everybody could, you know, that were nonviolent offenders could get a chance at maybe getting out. So anyways, I applied. They finally um, sent a letter back and the lawyer, he was from Des Moines, he said, I don't have time for your case basically and I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. So I thought, you know, after you've exhausted all your stuff you still have a little tiny bit of hope but not very much you really don't believe right. anything anymore so anyways i tried it and or he you know said i was going to pass you on to somebody else and i said okay so i never heard anything never heard anything and then i got a call well not really a call but my case manager told me i had um, an interview with a lawyer a clemency lawyer so I met with her. She said, heard my story. She said, well, you know, there's no guarantees, but we'll try. And she knew I'd already um, applied for a clemency and got denied just recently. So she went ahead and took my case anyways, and it worked. But I'm going to tell you the thing that worked, I think, the most for me in getting and receiving my clemency. The same judge that sentenced me wrote a letter on my behalf. Oh, so, that's awesome. That doesn't yeah. happen much. Yeah, no, he wrote a letter on my behalf and um, it stated, I was wrong by a country mile. I wish if I had to do it over again, I would give her less time and da, da, da. And yeah, it was amazing. I could show you the letter sometime if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I mean, you just don't hear of judges doing that, especially yeah. admitting that they're wrong. 
Yeah. Uh, was your judge uh, hardcore? Uh, what what was yep. the judge like? Yeah, and I still, the whole time I was in prison, I still remember the words he said to me was, you deserve what you got. You put all those drugs out there, you know, and he was right. I did deserve to be punished. No, I don't feel that I didn't, but 24 years, I was like, who did, who died, you know? Yeah. How old were you when you got your sentence? 36, 37. So 24 years, you're thinking, oh man, my life is over pretty much. I'm yep. going to spend uh, the rest of my life in here if I survive it. I'll be yep. lucky to survive it to get out. Yes. Yeah. So talk to me about prison life. We'll go back to the clemency, but what was commissary like? What were the jobs like? The people, uh, visitation, just, you know, well-rounded description of prison life. Well, I'm going to tell you this. You meet some amazing women there. You meet some amazing people that have stories that, you know, now I think of all those stories. I'm, I'm slowly trying to put together a book to tell you about should. my life. Yeah. Absolutely. And the people that you meet there and their stories, it's like you're almost repulsed by them, but at the same time you can relate to them. It's so, it's such a mixture of feelings because these women are just women, their moms, their daughters, their sisters, you know, whatever it might be, they have a story and not saying it's an excuse for the crime that they've committed, but they have stories and it's just, you know, you kind of They're have still empathy. People. Yeah, yeah. People. Yeah, but now you the job there. Go ahead. Go ahead. The jobs are they're menial. I did um, worked in the kitchen. I had a commissary job. The longest job I had was in horticulture. That was pro pretty much the whole time I was at Wasika, and I took all their programs they had. You know, landscape maintenance, land our grounds and turf, greenhouse um, specialist, all that stuff. I took all that. I did everything I could to improve my train, train of thought and try to get better with myself. And, and um, the jobs are, you know, you get used to it, I guess. You only make 12 cents an hour. You're lucky. At commissary, I made a dollar something an hour, you know? I mean- so The job is different. You get paid different amounts of money for different jobs. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you get, as you get, you can make 12 cents to 14 cents to 17 cents. You know, I mean, they're, it's nothing compared to out here, of course. But, right. But yeah. it also doesn't cover your expenses in there either. It absolutely does not. And people don't understand that. They're, it's so expensive just to buy shampoo. <clears throat> and <clears throat> if, if you don't have anybody to help you at all, it's tough. People hustle. That's what they do in there. They hustle to make that, their That's what I was going to ask you. Did you have a hustle? Yeah, I did for a while off and on. I used to make these little round um, peanut butter cups and they were, I used the lid of a peanut butter jar and, would, and made this dough stuff or whatever and put <clears throat> chocolate on the top and I sold them for a dollar a piece and yeah. And Everyone I think, them. oh yeah, like crazy. I couldn't keep them away. I couldn't make enough of them. And since there's no actual currency changing hands, that dollar a piece was people were exchanging commissary for what you were making them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. But it, it was certainly helpful. You know, I mean, sure. yes, it's against the rules and everything like that, but it was definitely, Hey, you know, I'll sell some of these, make some more of this, and then I can buy some shampoo or some toothpaste or whatever the situation might've been. I was in at the time. Yeah. So, it's very unfortunate yeah. that, that it's, at least hygiene's not provided to you, right? You know, that's yeah. Well, at Carswell it is, but it's little bitty ones like about this big, you know. Right. So. And you probably can only get so many a month. One. Mm -hmm. One. One a month. So I guess you get to wash your hair twice a month. <laughs> yeah, and, and if your hair is long or anything like that, you're you're had. So. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. your family, what was it like for them? You were indicted. You were arrested. You were pulled away and then slapped with this huge long sentence what what was life like for them um well my kids kind of my oldest daughter got separated she went with one of my sisters then she went with her dad and you know she ended up having my granddaughter when she was 18 so 
things kind of went, you know, I mean, it was tough on everybody, really. And my younger kids, they lived with their grandparents for a while while my ex-husband was overseas, so. Mm -hmm. So they bounced I mean, around, too, a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're probably more stable than my oldest daughter, though, right. for sure. So let's go back to clemency. What does it mean? What happened? You got approved, and then what happened? You were doing, you were at 12 years in, roughly, and, and half, yeah. you received clemency. What was, what was that like, and what does that mean? Well, it means that the stipulation on my thing was I did nine months of drug treatment, and then I got to go home, and that was amazing. That is amazing. So they basically vacated the remainder of your sentence. Yep. So you they got changed. to go home in half the time that you would have. Right. Yep. They changed my complete out date. The only stipulation, like I said, was that I did um, the drug treatment program. Is that RDAP? Which, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, for those of you watching, RDAP is a drug treatment program. And for most people who go in, if they're eligible for RDAP, if they complete it, it takes like a year off of their sentence, roughly. Yeah. In her yep. case, it was a, a, she had to do it before she could go home. It was part of the terms of clemency. And then you yep. still had to do probation. I still, yep, I still had to do probation. Now, not everybody does when they receive clemency, but that was most of the people that I knew got it still had to do um, clemency. Do but, you know what the percentage I mean, is? Probation. Of yes, right. Do you, mm -hmm. do you know what the percentage is of people who get clemency? A very small amount. I'm very not really sure. The exact, yes, yes. The, the year I got, there was only like a thousand people out of two million people. So that's a lot that, yeah. that I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of people, but a little bit of people who got it. So yeah. 2 million people, 1000 people got clemency. That's a very, very, very small percentage. And yeah. that's, you're very, very fortunate. So what's life been like when you got out? Um, <laughs> takes some getting used to, I tell you, I'm still struggles days with the technology. I think it was sensory overload on everything as far as choices there were so many choices you go in a fast food restaurant you're like ah, i don't know what i want right. or in a grocery <laughs> store it's like <laughs> everywhere and i think the hardest toughest thing is being trying to figure out where i fit into my kids lives mm -hmm. they were all kids now they're all adults you know so right and then three months after i after I got out, when I was still in the halfway house, my oldest son died, so. Oh, no. Yeah. That's hard he to was, manage. Yeah. It's been really rough. He was in a car accident. Mm -hmm. How old was he? 24. That's a hard thing to overcome. I don't, I don't care who you are, what your relationship is. When you lose, when you lose a loved one, it's just hard to overcome. Yeah. regardless of situation so are you That's working now second kid i've lost i've lost i lost a baby before oh, I you to did. well i'm sorry you've had to go through so much that's just horrible yeah. yeah are you working what was it like to get a job um well i had when i was in iowa i had worked at Hagee's or john deere just and I really didn't have any problems getting a job in Iowa. I really didn't. I think, I don't know if every time they checked my background check, it didn't show up or they just never mentioned it. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it had been so long that maybe it wasn't, it didn't come up, but. On a federal, never, on, on a state background check, which is what most employers run, it won't come up if it's federal charges. Now, if they run federal, it, it will come up. Uh, but some employers don't ask, uh, some employers mm -hmm. don't check. And if they don't ask, it's really none of their business. So that's the way, the way I feel about it. If they, if they yeah. want to know, then they'll ask. Mm -hmm. I kind of had mixed feelings about that. Like I wanted to be totally honest with everybody about everything when I come out. I'm not saying I'm still not, but I just, I wanted, I wanted it to be up front and out there. I didn't want it to feel like it was ever going to be an elephant in the room. And I found that, like you said, it really, if they didn't ask, it really wasn't their business. Mm -hmm. And I had that problem though, even in relationships I tried to do right off the bat, I'm telling you exactly where I've been, what happened, da, da, da. I was revealing too much information that I didn't need to tell people, you know? Because you didn't, I mean, give, them, my, you didn't give them a chance to meet you. 
they yeah. they were meeting your past before they met the woman that you've become. Yeah. Do you feel that you've become a better person going through prison? And oh, definitely. Yeah. If I, I if hear I that hadn't from people. Yeah, as sad as it sounds, if I hadn't done all that, I'd still be using. I would. I, I honestly think I would because I was on a path of self destruction, really. So I mean, I'd like that. To, yeah, I'd like to sit and say that everything about prison was horrible, but, and it was horrible. It's horrible to be away from your family, your children, your, your life, period, any opportunities you have, or, but the truth is that it helped save me, you know, right. how does that right. sounds? Well, you are very fortunate because some people come out of prison still hating the system and hating what happened to them and not taking responsibility for their own actions and why they were in there in the first place. So you used it to better yourself and you have a lot to be proud of. And that's something that the judge saw or he would have never wrote that letter. So yeah. for, for them to see that says huge things about who you are today. And then for uh, President Obama to see that, you know, he's, I'm sure he read the letter. He's read your file. He's not just letting people out just to let them out. He no, picked the best not. of the candidates that applied, and, and you fit that bill, which was wonderful. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. Uh, now, how long yeah. did it take? You got denied, and then you reapplied. How long did it take to actually get it from that time you got the, the lawyer to help you fight? Well, I started my case with my clemency lawyer, uh, Jane Ann Murray, when I was in Waseca. Then I went to Phoenix, and I was there about a year before I actually received it. Okay. So. so about 12 months, which actually is pretty quick because the judicial system works very slow. Yeah. I mean, in my, in my opinion, I, I think 12 months is, is a fairly quick amount of time. Yeah, I actually, well, we'd been working on it before, you know, before, right. but I would say probably a year. The funny thing about my clemency is, which I always think is fun. I got it on November 4th of 2016, <laughs> which the exact <laughs> day I got Mm -hmm. The exact day I got busted was November. Oh, it is, 4th, which is also close to election time, 2016, yep. with the new president coming in. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But it was also the same same uh, same date that you got arrested. Yeah, November fourth of 2005. So, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, um. What would you like to tell the public? If there's anything you would like people to know, what would you like them to hear? Well, I would like them to know that not only are we people, but we all have stories. And it's easy to judge, some, judge someone without knowing the full story of what they, they've been through. And maybe if we're just a little more empathetic and have compassion for people, and their stories and what they've been through, then maybe we can help change the way laws are, you know? Very well said, very well said. Don't hang up, I've got something for you. I'm gonna connect you to somebody that got a pardon and somebody else that does things helping people coming out of rehab. They're in different states, but maybe the three of you guys can meet and get to know each other. So stay on. Thanks everybody for watching. If you have okay. any questions about this, please contact me. Uh, look her up on Facebook. That's Zoanne Brown, Zoanne being one word. And uh, I'm sure she would answer any questions. And thank Absolutely. you again for watching.